Oh, it's not too bad. Da 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 da. Hello. Pick them up. Pick them up quite well on the recording. Okay. If the, if that's the case, then let me just try it now. Yeah. If you want to double double check, go for it. Do the third one. These are such crappy mics. Test. Test one. Does it pick me up pretty well? It's coming through. And the pterodactyl. Oh, yes. Uh, where the on switch is. Here, obviously, I'd be a lot louder. You're a lot louder. Okay. I'm sure that was painful. Okay. Hello. One, two, three. A, B, C. And I'm now talking right onto the front. And I should still be in the camera shot. And it's still coming through clear enough? Yeah. Should I? Maybe I should just up the volume just a little bit so it's a little clearer. So if they do use this, okay, yeah, this is nice and loud, I think. Yeah. And this carries through better when I'm here. Yeah. Okay, I like this. This will do. Okay. And I can do the same in the other room then too. Okay. I think the fact that you have your microphone on there and it's blasting it through the speakers makes it pick it up. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Good enough. Let me switch the battery. Oh, they already used the batteries on this. Oh, here's more. batteries. Yep, and we're full up.
Okay, uh, we're missing a short jumper, uh, the Cat5 cable for here. Oh, and that's your Cat5. Uh, let me run upstairs then and grab one. Yeah, uh, just a short one. Sure. Hey, how's it going? Change the URL. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs>
Cool. Cool. Proximity to the shadow behavior. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> sure. So you had to uh, win, you have to 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 win, I see, I see lots of space. Can I come down? Yeah, if you come closer to your voice, we'll be heard by the like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. I promise I don't bite spit. You know, kind of crazy stuff. I wouldn't even throw a shock at you if you're not paying attention to my presentation. This is like old school, like. When was the last time you were in a presentation? Oh, yeah, they got chocolate. Chalkboard. Is it picking up? Yes. Can you hear me? Uh, are we about ready to start? All set? Perfect. So uh, welcome to Smart Week 2014, day three. We've actually made it this far into the breakout sessions. And uh, we actually have uh, three uh, speakers. And uh, based on the agenda, we're going to have Ian actually go first. And we'll follow the order according to the schedule. So I wanted to introduce you to Ian. Ian, and it's Pilon. He's helping to move Waterloo Region into the center of an exploding segment of the technology market that will soon dwarf the one occupied by smartphones, tablets, PCs combined, the Internet of Things, or IoT. Ian is a user experience designer at Sun Life Financial in Waterloo, who has a keen interest in the IoT a burgeoning field of connected devices that use embedded, embedded technology to sense and communicate. I'd like to introduce you to Ian Pilon. Thank you very much. And thank you everybody for being here. Um, it's nice to see some familiar faces in the crowd. And thank you everybody for joining online. So we're gonna get started. If you want to follow me, uh, you can find me on Twitter. And I, I am at Sun Life, but I also have founded the Internet of Things Waterloo, where I get to learn about this, uh, this emerging space with the people in our community, um, and I can learn more about where my future is going in design. <clears throat> so today I'm going to be talking about how UX design uh, fits with this emerging space. And doing that, I'm going to go over my journey on how I got here. Um, UX design in the Internet of Things systems and services, and why include UX design in Internet of Things projects. So my journey started back when I discovered the uh, graffiti research labs out of New York City. These guys are um, an art collective who were using uh, laser um, lasers and project projectors to to tag buildings. Uh, this is the first time I've seen something that kind of blew my mind as far as people interacting with uh, the physical world in new ways that I'd never seen before. Uh, man, this has got to be about five years back now. Uh, so they're, they're a really cool group and doing interesting things. And I started to get this um, thought that the interface could now be the world around me. It didn't necessarily have to be a screen anymore. Uh, and that got me really excited on uh, what these guys were doing. So at that time, I was only doing web design and development, and I started to go, 
I want to know how they're doing this. How are they getting laser beams on the side of buildings? Um, and then these guys started moving into another uh, really interesting project, which was the iWriter. For an artist that goes by the name of Tempt out of California, who, was, uh, quadru who became a quadriplegic, and he used to be a, a very big name graffiti writer um, in LA. So the GRL thought, how can we let this guy still be an artist? He can only move his eyes. So they invented the eye writer, which was um, named by Time Magazine as one of the top 50 inventions in, don't quote me on the, on the date, but it was a couple of years back now. Uh, really cool where these guys went from you know laser beams on the side of buildings now we're talking about getting somebody to write on a building through the internet in real time so this guy's in a hospital bed writing with his eyes through a software application that's projecting on the building as you can see in the back um, giving this guy a chance to still be an artist so to me I started looking at design from this interaction standpoint of the physical world, the digital world, they can meet and they can start to collide. So art was a, a great way for me to, to get into this space. I was fortunate enough to try this experience in uh, Kitchener, uh, back at the Kafka conference. James Powderly, who is one of the inventors of this, um, he, he was there representing this device. I said, I got to try it. I got up. Um, the thing about using it is your head has to be really, really still. So he squished my head in a pillow and he's, this, this yellow band around my head is like ratcheted to um, a, a piece of workout equipment that I'm sitting on. But basically your head can't move. Uh, it's very sensitive to calibrate this. Um, and then you enter into you know the projections on the side of a building, which I don't have a picture of it here, but um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with uh, Illustrator that works like dropping anchor points. So that's how the software works. As I'm moving my eyes around, it's following the direction and if I stare at a point long enough, it drops an anchor point. And then if I move my eyes, the, there's a little handle on it that's moving with it. And then I focus on an area and don't move my eyes, it drops another anchor point. And then you play almost like connect the dots. Very strenuous through your whole uh, neck, which was surprising. I had no idea this was gonna be hard on my my system, but I was up there for about 45 minutes to complete writing a, uh, a tag handle. So the experience behind that was something that can only be described by a user. Um, so it's in, in user experience design, I like to think you need to talk to users about um, how they're using things, but also watch them through eth ethnographic research. Uh, but yeah, one thing, experiencing it firsthand, you know, uh, is really a great way to describe how this product was. So with the GRL, I moved into going, okay, I'm a designer, but I need to learn about, um, I need to learn how to program, I need to learn about sensors. I was really excited, but I was like intimidated by the learning curve. So I started to learn about uh, maker spaces. Um, Kitchener has one called the, the Quartz Lab. Really cool to meet people that are all about sharing their knowledge. Uh, you know, I show up, I'm like, hey, I want to build things with lasers. They're like, okay, come on in. <laughs> um, so maker spaces were cool in that sense that the, it, they'll let anybody in and they'll start sharing what they know. Um, it turned out to be a lot more complicated than what I thought of just getting lasers and start drawing on buildings. Uh, it's, it's very technical. Uh, and actually, this guy actually uh, told me a lot about that. So I brought in some, let uh, some medical lasers. He's like, yeah, these won't work. Uh, so I dialed it back and it was like, okay, well, what can I learn about? I started learning about Arduinos through another makerspace right near our area um, called uh, Diode. Simon Clark, the guy in the top right there, super cool guy teaching these kids who are like eight years old how to get into programming sensors really, really quickly. So he invented the device there on the right, which is a shield that goes into an Arduino. And the beauty of this thing is, I'm a designer. I don't know nothing about programming. Uh, or if, if you're an eight-year-old kid and you want to go, well, how can I start playing with sensors? Boom, plug that into an Arduino, open up software interface, copy and paste some code. And you could start uh, taking the, a button to turn on an LED, switch the code, um, and start playing with the uh, 
you know, the hall sensor to do something, get the, get the motor spinning, and a kid or a designer gets excited really fast. It, it, it accelerates that learning curve. So for a designer, I was like, okay, that's really cool. I'm now less intimidated about going further into this space of uh, where this can go. And that's just a close up of some of the, and I have this here as well, if anybody wants to see it, I brought it along with me. So that's kind of how I got here, um, through art and going, you know what, how does a designer get across the bridge and, and start learning about um, hardware? Um, so that, I think, is one arm of UX design, which is interaction design. Um, but also, what is UX design then if interaction design is only one part of that? Um, user experience design encompasses all aspects of the user's interaction uh, with services and products. And I also like to think of it as balancing a business needs and a user's needs, finding that harmony. Um, so it, it's, it's about both, in my perspective. Uh, there are many di different disciplines, as you can see from here. Um, the user research, usability evaluation, or usability testing, information architecture, user interface design, which I find common is everybody's going, oh, you're a UX designer? Well, then you're going to design an interface. Well, it's not about that. It's, it's, it's more UX design is a broad discipline, so people can specialize in a lot of different areas. I can do uh, user interface design, but I like to, to educate the people that don't know about it. Other areas of UX design, one of them being interaction design, so what I talked about earlier was interacting with the, uh, the physical world. Um, so here's an example of interaction design thinking with the Internet of Things that I thought was really cool. Um, if th so this is a sensor that goes below kegs in a bar. And the bar owner now has visibility into the levels of, you know, all of the, the beer he has on tap. So if I go into a bar and I go, like, hey, I want a Guinness, oh, and they go to the tap and they find out, well, oh, there's only a half of one left, and you just killed my experience of being at your establishment. So these guys are really cool. I believe they're called Steady Serve, um, and they're just, you know, going right into this market of all bar owners that have you know, X amount of kegs that need to monitor them, this is great for them to never have an experience, a, a person come in and have a bad experience. I come in, I want to get us, yep, they know. And they'll know beforehand, before the keg runs out, the, the, the server can get an alert. Hey, you know, Guinness, you're at a quarter tank, it's gonna be rush hour at you know, whatever time, nine o'clock at night, uh, we better change the, the keg earlier, get ready for that, um, that to happen. So sensors can do that. I'm really excited about this space. So I often uh, do my work at Starbucks because I have uh, a lot of children running around the house. So I got to get out where I can get some work done. Every time I go to Starbucks, I'm sorry, not every time. A lot of the time I go to Starbucks, um, I go to make my coffee and those milk and cream dispensers are empty. Has anybody else experienced this in here? Okay, so wow, okay, we got a good show of hands. That to me is a bad, that's a bad thing to happen, right? I'm like, okay, I just paid my money, now I gotta make it myself, okay? All right, I, I get that you're giving me an establishment to chill and do my work on, but really, you, you can't, you, you have no visibility into when this milk keeps running out. So I would go back and I would say, slap one of these sensors underneath that milk thing and send your server an alert and go, look, your milk is, you know, it's almost empty, change it before the next guy comes in and discovers that it's empty. That's your job to change the milk, not mine to tell you. Because a lot of times, now this girl is hustling, it's not her fault, she's hustling trying to serve the next person in line, and I gotta interrupt her flow, and I go, hey, excuse me, excuse me, uh, the milk, you know, can I get some more milk? That breaks her flow up. So that's something where I could see remixing. How can we take ideas like the bar uh, idea and go, hey, what is it going to cost it to add this interaction over in this environment? That's what really gets me excited about this space, is now that I, I've, I've gotten this far, I can start to see the world differently with the Internet of Things and going, wow, there's just, you know, there's so many places that can improve their, their services with simple sensors. Interaction designers are good at identifying those those pain points in a, in a customer's journey, I think that adds real value to your business if you had uh, UX designers or interaction designers that study these types of uh, friction points in your business. 
So why include uh, UX design in your project? To cut through the noise, it's a competitive market. Experience design is something that says, we may be building the same product as our, as our uh, customer, but I'm gonna make it better just because I do more uh, research with my end users. I'm gonna find out what it makes them tick. Why are they doing business with us? I'm gonna make that seamless. I'm gonna you know, try effortlessly to make the, the experience of using our service, our product, better than our competitors. That's the way to stand out this day and age. Um, interaction design is also about visualizing and thinking about things as they might be, which is great when we're coming into an emerging space that has a lot of new opportunities. Uh, you'll have people that'll go, you know, well, well, what can we do? Well, interaction designer that thinks about this stuff all day long, and they're gonna crank out ideas left, right, and center because they're just visionaries. Um, so it's not about the things, it's about the experiences. And we covered my journey, uh, how UX design is um, coming into systems and services, and then why you should include UX design in your next project. For business opportunities, you can contact me at my uh, Gmail. But I'm also looking for future speakers at uh, our Internet of Things Waterloo event. I've been trying to get Jeff over here from really active down, uh, so hopefully that can happen in the future, because we are growing. It's actually growing really big. Uh, Wackerly, who was here earlier on the first day, wants to partner up with us, so there's gonna be a good relationship to, to foster Waterloo and make bigger things happen there. So uh, I'd love to have anybody who's interested to come down to Waterloo, come talk to me after, and we can set something up. Okay, thank you very much. I'd like to introduce you now to uh, Wayne, Wayne Powell of SAP. Commitment to quality and a passion for learning. Wayne Powell is a well-rounded, multidisciplined member of the newly formed Emerging Technologies Group with SAP. Educated as a systems design engineer from the University of Waterloo, he has become a relative veteran of mo mobility development, working with mobile devices since the first set of handhelds over 15 years ago. Wayne has a strong commitment to building the next generation of quality systems and applications. Over the years, he has been involved with various parts of the development process, including application development, design, UX, and testing. I'm pleased to introduce you to Wayne Powell. Thank you, Susan. Why don't you guys come down here so I don't have to shout sounds or I promise we don't spit or anything. Yeah, come on down. There's lots of space in the front here, so, so you could. Trevor's your, uh, your... Yeah, that one, the only presentation. That's one right here? Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Can you leave it? You made a little typo on the first slide. Change the date. Sure, let's just close that. Last camp page would be better. Yeah. Just change this date. Sure. So, No, I'm gonna admit it. I'm, I'm totally like, I just want to fix it in case it, once I send it to Helen, then it gets replicated like a bazillion times. So, okay. Yeah, okay. Here, 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 here. There you go. Okay, hey, so can everybody see that? Okay, so here we go. Um, thank you for coming. Uh, I was actually gonna show up without a presentation, just steal one of the other guys, but, because we're kind of talking all about the same thing, but, uh, Let's talk, this, so this is my first apology slide. I, I've been known to talk very fast and so on and so forth. So you, you, for those people on live stream, you won't have this option, but I'm giving the option of the people here that if, if you've seen Pulp Fiction. Uh, I tend to talk fast and go fast, and if you have any questions at all, please, I'm 
open call to come on and tell me to slow down or ask me any questions. So yeah, somebody, this is my nickname in their company. Somebody gave it to me about 10 years ago. It's kind of stuck. So first of all, let's talk why, why, who are you and why you're here. Well, that was a great introduction by Suzanne. Um, turns out, uh, I don't know, have you ever seen this other book called Don't Make Me Think uh, by Steve Krug? I mentioned on page 194 when he added a whole section on, us uh, on usability and mobile. Uh, we talked a little bit and he was nice enough to acknowledge me, so there's at least somebody in the industry who thinks I might know something about the uh, usability. Uh, I I'm actually also play a lot of different hats over the years. I I'm a design thinking coach. Uh, Helen's come to one of my sessions. Uh, in the past, in different lives I've done, I've, I've actually these are, uh, this is a symbol MC9060, and this is another symbol reader here, um, Motorola symbol reader. I, I used to uh, manage or direct a pro RFID middleware product with uh, Sybase, and to prove to you that I actually do, I was there before mobile. This is down here, is, this is a Philips Neo, it's running CE 1.0, I was doing Sharky 10, so we were writing the first level generation of code on that in Palm Pilot. I remember doing RIM devices that had to go to Mobile Texas server in Houston, so we would joke about it when we started working in the industry. It was kind of like we had jobs that advertised, we need five years of Java experience, and we're like, obviously this company knows nothing about Java, because Java hasn't been around for five years. <laughs> so, so, yeah, so also, besides working for SAP, um, I, I have a couple of blogs that kind of on my own, so not necessarily affiliated, but I'm here mostly because Helen asked me, but uh, I, hopefully I know a lot about different things that I can kind of put. Right now the internet things have been great because it's kind of an amalgamation of all these different things together. So why SAP? Okay, so you're from SAP, like they're not a UX company, they, 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 they write middle and backward, they don't make hardware, so why are you even here talking about us about that? Well, I'm actually from an emerging technologies division within SAP. Uh, we recently named, I think, CDI, which is Custom Driven Innovation. But generally speaking, what we used to do is we look at all the amazing things that are out there that SAP should get into. And we've actually been started huge within uh, Internet of Things. We've run projects with uh, University of Guelph for smart green roofing and all. Uh, right now, we're working with Cisco and doing a couple other things. Some things I can chill you, some things I can't. Um, but I wanted to give you a little bit of idea about SAP because usually when I talk to people, SAP is probably one of the largest companies that you've never heard of. We have market caps around, uh, I think, almost 100 billion now, so we're like four times the size of MLSE, <laughs> the guys who run the Maple Leafs. But basically, we own, like, with an IBM partner, we basically have the world record for the largest database. Uh, we have a HANA in memory database that's radically changing things. Um, other than that, we have our own core aspects. We're no longer just a back end uh, system. Uh, application. We have app analytics like Numera, we have maps, we have mobile apps, we have database, we have cloud, so we have purchasing like uh, just recently Concur, which, which is probably the largest, I guess, cloud based purchase uh, for the ex travel expense coming. But we have the unfortunate part of having our software very long lived. People love our software, install it, and run it for 40 years. Guess what? That user experience 40 years ago, which was excellent and awesome, does not really apply now. So we're changing things, but we don't always see it because of the, the, our install base. Some of our install base generally likes to change things slowly. So we're moving them over to cloud so we can change that experience very quickly. But somebody once told us we have almost like 300,000 pages to, to, to update and change all the time. So if you see some of our stuff and you say, oh, it's not that modern, give us some slack. We've actually won some awards. This is a 2014 uh, UX Awards. We won that. At Inter IXDA gave us another award for our fan experience. Uh, I mean, our. Uh, uh, fan uh, profile app that they're using for scouting for the 49ers. And, and so there's much enough different stuff that we're, we're doing in the market. You just don't always see it. So that's enough about that side. So ready, right? Are you guys ready to do the talk now? Like we got all that stuff out. Let's do the UX talk now, all right? UX and IT ready. So probably even talked about a lot, a lot of times. But uh, this is sort of similar to Scott Jensen's idea, except I won't come up and tell you I'm Google and leave because there's not 100 people here or something like that. But the idea is that. I reverse this pyramid and said, this is sort of Internet of Things for me. This is the three C's. So the first part was control. Everything has a device. You just start in motion. You, you have some interaction with it. And then what you do is we improve that by making those devices connected. Okay? So what we do is put them online. So how many people own like Harmony Remote? Something like that? Anything like that? Ever try to like manually <coughs> go and like do your TV and do your thing now? These, you're like, never again. It would work, it's better if it works perfectly, but the idea is that like connected makes a big difference, right? So that, that, that 
item there works because it's connected. Uh, XB radios there, smart mesh networks, all kinds of crazy stuff. Now the next generation of stuff is that once we got everything in, so this is sort of internet of things, where do we get that power from? That power comes from cooperation coordination. So the internet, like supposedly practically terror proof and all these other things, but the idea is that the internet is really a cooperation of nodes and all that other stuff. It's sort of organic, it changes over time and stuff like that. And that's why nobody really owns it and that's why it's been able to outlast a lot of different other technologies. Like some of us used to like dial into like BBSs and stuff like that, but we won't talk. We'll pretend that never happened. Uh, so the other thing is a new one, like you don't believe that organic stuff works with the connected community. Take a look at Bitcoins, right? Obviously the prices have fluctuated and we have the Mt. Gox and stuff like that, but uh, organically this is a growth of individuals who are collaborating and, and they're working together. And that collaboration gives it that power. So that's why we say reverse the curve, the top part is this coordination and cooperation part. That is, in essence is the internet of things. So I probably repeated things you've heard for the last two days. So let's get, let's get talking about it. So Roger, Roger, got it? Okay, done. So what, what, what does that mean? I'll give you an example. And I tried to pick an example that's extremely relevant. Making a presentation, auditorium, projectors. Okay, so let's take a look. The top part is what we had about 20 years ago. So you can probably validate <laughs> that. Uh, we had little buttons that physically change things. Um, we changed the projector or we were hooking up the DVD. If you look in the picture close enough, the first button actually says VCR. <laughs> okay, so, so we're talking about way, way old days. This is how we did it. We cranked it out, everybody was custom. We, you know, uh, we had to generate this piece of hardware and it kind of only worked for that one time. So the second generation, we moved up a little further. We said we had, we, we had displays, like touch screens, like haptic devices. Now we can get in there, we can change things, we can update the ROM, and then we have some displays and we can, okay, well, we can localize it to French, we can do all these kind of other things to it. Uh, we can change it around, maybe VCRs are updated, I need a Blu-ray player, we can update that. Well. Actually, that's not where the cutting technology is. Right now, actually, cutting technology is another apps, remote apps and connected devices where I can bring in a projector and it automatically connects and talks and discovers itself and, and projects and picks up different things. So, so really, that was that pyramid that I was talking about. So if you want to so, show a visualization, and we could probably look at this terminal here as where it, where it sits in the timeline, but that in itself, folks, everything is like this. We can draw a timeline pretty much for everything like this. So think about how this affects how you interacted with the original, the updated model, and the today future model. It's going to change. Wait, so just like the Star Wars inside jokes, like, uh, you know, Anakin, I have a bad feeling about this. So what does that mean? This is from Propeller, the guys at Rebirth, I don't know if you guys are into like music, but like, these guys are brilliant. Their software plugins are brilliant. UX, not so brilliant. Because <laughs> I'll show you what happened. So these are type of modules. If you're hardcore into music and stuff like that, we used to collect these modules, and they've been around since the 80s, and they're worth more than their weight in gold, as long as they're still working, their paper caps haven't blown out or whatever that kind of stuff. But we have like, you know, drum machines, 808s, like sometimes rap music, you hear all this term like 808. That, these guys are talking to a particular sound of a particular device. Well, guess what? These guys are like, that's amazing. No longer are we in the silicon age. We can make, digitize this, and put all these plugins in. That's great. I can have one program that will have all, my whole room, basement of toys. Unfortunately, they took it and replicated exactly. So if you were to actually play with Rebirth when it was around, these knobs, you kind of click around it and you, you kind of move your mouse up a little bit or down a little bit and it rotates them up. You have no idea how much rotation it is. You have no idea of like the stopping and stuff like that. But folks, what they did is they say, you want to move into the internet stage? You want to move into the software world? We're going to take everything and we'll move exactly into the software world. Folks, that is an anti-pattern, okay? It's not simple replication. This is, say, the lowest C. We're talking about that control, right? These are knobs and dials and figures and dials. This was the second C that we're talking about connected and stuff like that. This was already anti-pattern back then. Guess what when you do it? on the big scale with the Internet of Things. So I'm probably here giving you the anti-presentation, which is saying what not to do is, it's not simply Internet of Things, it's not just things connected together. We have to look at the model again. We have to break things down and go from first principles and say, hey, how are we interacting with things? Just simply making it work does not make it work. Right? Okay. So let's take a look at another example, Nest. Google bought them out and they're super, super famous now. How many people actually have one of these Nest things in their house? Nobody? 
Okay, a couple people. Yeah, great. So first one, this is like a Honeywell dial from like the 70s. It has like sort of thermostat inside of it. Direct manipulation. You all adjust this and adjust the thermometer, and basically you can set the heat once, and then that's what it is. Direct control, direct manipulation. Then we moved into the, this more modern day uh, digital screen uh, Honeywell, and you have a programmer, and it works. It's harder to use than your VCR. It was in the 80s because it's, it's, it's crazy. But now what we're moving into is Nest. Nest actually from a distance actually looks very much like this first one, but with the direct manipulation. But really the power comes from the semi and artificial intelligence with it, the web app that gives it the control, the monitoring and stuff like that. If you have actually worked with the app, it kind of has a lot of different neat things and it kind of like, there's optimizations in the system where like there's still heat in the coils after a heater, after it, you turn off your, so it doesn't turn off your blower right away. And there's other all kinds of neat, neat things that are added in the system. And you can tweak the heck out of this thing because of the app. This itself is, this I would argue is very simple to that, but it's the combination of this connected, this cooperation. You can now get Nest to work with your other devices and you can figure out whether you're in your room or not. You can figure out, you, you know, all these other things. And, and that's that connected cooperation, that top level C that we're sort of talking about. So, talking more about consumer different devices, SAP is actually, in, especially in Germany, we have this new thing called, uh, I think, Rami said a third revolution. We've actually calling it the fourth revolution. It's called Industry 4.0. I just wanted to use this. We're not all factory people, but I've worn my hat and hairnet on and been on the floor with RFID and serialization. But I was kind of showing you how the world outside of consumerism views like Internet of Things. So this is the very, very first mechanical loom that was about 1784. Okay? And then this is talking about Cynthia and Addie Slaughter. This is supposed to be the first conveyor belt. So meat moves around. You know, people aren't picking up carrying it anymore. That was supposed to be sort of your second revolution. We had, I don't know, Henry Ford-ish kind of type of thing. And then, ironically, the first PLC from Rome only came around in 1969. So all these things we think about factories and stuff like that, a lot of that innovation, Alan Bradley, all this stuff, have only come sort of recently. And that was the ability to kind of say, we have a light state sensor, we have a conveyor belt, it will move automatically, stamp these things, all this stuff. It, we, we can kind of do a bunch of different things. And the conveyor belt can, can talk to itself in a little bit. What we're proposing now with SAP in Germany is Industry 4.0. The term is cyber physical uh, systems. The idea is they interact with each other. We're hoping to be at a point in time where an empty bottle of shampoo can move to a conveyor belt. It has a certain barcode and everything like that. And it can know what to fill it up with, how much to fill it up with. We don't have to rejig lines every morning because a lot of times we've actually been on the factory floor. A bridge light player guy who runs the factory, sets this thing up for a couple of days, we get runs and then so on and so forth, and there's a lot of things in the background to make it work. The actual production is very efficient, but the actual rejigging of all that other stuff does not meet like some of the other advancements that have with just-in-time inventory and Amazon's, I will sell to you before you think you buy it, right? So, so the pre-selling, but the idea is here, this is exactly what it is. If you look at the picture, the idea is that it's this cooperation. The factory is smart enough of itself. We sort of invented you know, these droids or these drones to be able to do that, okay? So, uh, once again, uh, you're always like, uh, I sense much fear in you, right? So, Wayne, that sounds kind of obvious. What the heck scares you? Okay, well, a lot of things scare me. So, this is probably the meat of the presentation. I probably should put tons of slides in there, but I thought we'd have a discussion panel afterwards. I'm gonna put four top-level things in my anti-presentation here of things that I think will be concerning as we move into the Internet of Things and designing UX for that. The first one is uh, channels and connectors. Did anybody here use like uh, Zively, Patch Bay, if, if then as I was a little bit? Okay, so you kind of understand me that the idea is great. Every time I take a photo, I want to send it to my buddies or I want to Instagram it out. Like, wait, that's magic. How come my device doesn't do this already and Apple hasn't added it in? Maybe they will, but right now we have to use programs like if. And I'm like, okay, phone has picture application, phone has email application. Should be easy connecting these things together. Hold the bow. It's actually not. And if you actually use any of these applications, they're very limited. They're limited to what they call channels. And they're basically interaction points with the different things. That is a big part of the Internet of Things. That's the problem. We don't have these standards. We don't have this interaction. So right now you're using these kind of clumsy, we call, we call, they call them formulas and if, but the idea is, you know, if you do this and you have to do a bunch of logic, and, and it's kind of like what Ian says, you have to make, you have to go to the maker lab and get down and get your hands dirty to do these kind of things. 
I'm hoping that's not the user experience we have for the future, okay? Because it's, it's quite painful, and it's probably it's laughing <laughs> there, but yes, it, it is painful. So this connection, connectors thing, part of it's gonna be standard, but part of it, I believe we need a better UX paradigm to integrate things. Things like discovery, things like connection. Yes, question. So this is everybody making their own API? Uh, what happens is that if uh, they, they, they basically have their own, but they also write APIs for other people who are willing to, so they have this for like NAS, for like uh, Phyllis, and all that other stuff, and they kind of divide them together in their own API service that's exposable within their web, and then they basically, but there has to be a generic interface somewhere at some point in time to do the connectivity. And on top of that, there has to be a user experience to connect those, because you don't want to connect to everything, you just want to connect to some things that are important to you, right? Which actually is moving down to my next one, but context. But yes, that's that's exactly what it is. So so Zively is the same thing, which used to be patch bay, right? With or Gossip before, and they have their own gateway. They want to be the gateway of the internet, I think. But you have basically have to download an API if you're Arrow or AppNow to put your stuff on. You have to write, either write them or convince them to like one for you connector to get into the gateway. Lots of obstacles. It makes things very difficult. And right now, the problem with the channels is like with if if you ever used it, if something changes on the other side. Channel no good anymore. Something improves, you don't get that automatically. All those other things. So that's that user experience that we're kind of talking about. How do we get this discovery? Like Apple has launched your service and other things. Auto IP, like we have IP6, with MAC addresses and everything. They're all different, right? To get things online, right? I think that's going to change very soon. Or I'm hoping. Okay, don't go me. I'm going to be like the Bill Gates 64. <laughs> but next thing is, this is the one that's really interesting. So basically, the former CTO of. Uh, SAP, Vishal, he, he kind of got on one said, the future of commodity, one of these things that we're gonna be like talking about is actually selling algorithms. And I thought that that was a great thing. So I'm a, a system design grad, and I took my algorithm course, also took my IDOR course. But the rice cooker is no longer just make rice. It's fuzzy logic, you can make things with it, you can do other things with it. These algorithms, these bots, they're like these droids that you get to like nano droids that you get to put into things, and they do. Unfortunately, Back then, when you when your rice cooker has one button, the interaction is super easy. You on, off. Like you have to be a caveman not to understand the light when you press the buttons on. But once we these joys, how do you do that? Like you guys are playing like Starcraft. Like you know you have a million Zergs that you want to walk, and there's some artificial intelligence. The interface is to 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 control that level of intelligence to convey not action but intent is extremely difficult. And that's what we're talking about here. How do we come up with new UX paradigms to talk about algorithms and bots and controlling this? And when you're just giving gray type of direction, fuzzy logic instruction. I think that's gonna be quite neat. Third one here is RFID guy, huge for me. Filtering. Like that's kind of like what made like dummy readers and smart readers. It's like there are a bazillion signals coming out right now. The internet is only getting bigger with IPv6. We have huge amounts of data. How do we sift through that? like context, different other things. Like right now, you, you know, you, you walk in a room, there's only a couple access points, but what if we're, we're connecting to everything and anything? Well, everything's going to be yelling at you. They're all gonna be, the fridge is like, talk to me. I'm, I'm, I'm more important than the stove, talk to me, right? <laughs> Filtering is gonna be huge, because basically it's going to be like your email filter, but think worse, like everything, right? So we, we, need, we, need, some more, we need some more UX for that. And the last one is beyond haptic. So. Every movie you watch, like you know, uh, Minority Report, you know, uh, Matrix with the loading room, we have all these ideas that we're getting beyond touch panels and haptic because there's just too much information to do, and you're going to see this. So right now, everything, what you do is you interact with this device to get on the internet. You interact something else, you get on the internet. We're going to be moving where we're interacting directly with the fridge. Mm -hmm. Does it mean that this device is stuck on a fridge? No, it's going to be a different type of model. So what happens is beyond haptic. What that means is maybe augmented reality. What that means is maybe uh, contextually based things. We're talking about motion gestures, uh, you know, context of where you are, location based, and that kind of stuff. But all those other things are going to be worked into it. So I think you're going to see a revolution, hopefully, in in that as well. So I I'm kind of encouraging if there's designers and developers here that work a lot with Illustrator, <laughs> as you guys yeah, talking about, like that. the next of the future, I think, will be a little bit beyond that. That it's not always going to be that touch screen. It's going to be something a little bit different. It's not always going to be a kiosk turtle that allows you to have touch screen. Hopefully, you can interact with it with voice with different other things. So I've probably talked about my time, but uh, yeah. So that that's pretty much all I had in my anti presentation. But thank you guys for listening. I appreciate that a lot for coming. Thank you very much.
from. Thank you. Our next uh, presenter is Damian McCabe, co-founder and vice president of product at Connected Lab. Damian McCabe leads the product design and engineering teams at Connected Lab. Before starting Connected, he worked at Pivotal Labs, Extreme Labs, I IBM Global Business Solutions. Damien has been focused on mobile computing since the revolutionary releases of Android Froyo and iOS 4, and has worked on apps for CIBC, Uber, Air Canada, Target, Walmart, and Instagram. I'd like to welcome you to Damien McCabe. Thank you very much. All right, let's see if I can get this laptop sent to projector. First try. Nice. All right. Thanks. All right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for spending your Sunday morning with me. Um, when I heard I was presenting on a Sunday morning, I was like, is anyone going to show up? Um, so thanks very much for being here. Uh, excited to be here on the last day of the, the Smart Week conference. Um, it's been an awesome conference and uh, definitely exciting week overall. I was at some of the hardware workshops this week. Um, and uh, it's, been, it's been really, really great. So uh, just to get an idea of who's in the room today, uh, just want to see if I show hands. Developers? Yeah? Designers? Cool. Business people? Product people? Awesome. Cool. <laughs> Very cool. Is there a little feedback there? Is that OK? Good? OK. Cool. Awesome. All right. Uh, so today, going to talk about um, product design and the Internet of Things. Uh, I think there's a good enough intro for me, Damien McCabe, I'm at Connected Lab, before that Pivotal Lab, Extreme Labs, and IBM. Uh, over the past like six years or so, I've been working exclusively on mobile applications, um, and as I've been doing that, I've been seeing this like more and more increasing need for um, more connections beyond just like the person talking to the server that might like talk to another person. Um, and a lot of interest in connecting sensors to these applications. Um, and so that got me really excited. And that led me to start a new company, um, which I started just a few months ago, called Connected Lab. So just quickly, Connected Lab, we do um, agile product development, both hardware and software, um, as well as design. Uh, all under one roof, um, so we do the web and mobile, but also very interestingly, and what we're most interested in working on is uh, the wearable stuff and the Internet of Things things. So that's the company. Um, Want to cover off just quickly, I'm sure you guys, are, this audience should be familiar with IoT and what it is, but just want to make sure we're all you know on the same page. Uh, definitely a, quite the buzzword. Uh, if I got a penny for every time IoT was mentioned in some executive strategy session about what we should be working on, um, I think I'd be a rich person and uh, maybe not here this morning. But uh, breaking news, uh, we're not waiting for a new internet. I've talked to a few people and they're like, so when is this thing going to come? You know, like, who's going to set it up? Uh, and it's like, uh, it's already here. Um, you know, for the past like 15 years at least, there's been lots of indicators of sensors talking to the internet or private networks, uh, talking to each other and starting to make autonomous decisions and all these kinds of things. Um, and so nothing new, you see these, the longer, the older stuff you think of, I think of like supply chain stuff with RFIDs and packages and stuff and automatically package tracking and all that kind of stuff. So uh, we're not waiting for anything, it's here. Uh, I think what people are getting pretty excited about is some of the new platforms and infrastructure that's being put in place, it's making it a bit easier um, to work on this stuff. And um, that's that. So uh, just as like, you know, some, some facts, not facts, they're projections. Um, some projections of devices online by 2020, so kind of showing this uh, increasing need. Uh, uh, there, is, there is a bit of dispute as to how many devices will be online in 2020. Uh, Gartner tells us 26 billion. ABI research tells us 30 billion, and my favorite, and this is what I hope happens, um, Cisco saying 50 billion devices being online. So lots of projection about increasing number of devices online. 
and uh, obviously an increased amount of connectivity between these devices and obviously people can't be using all these devices so there is going to be a lot of devices talking to devices um, and an expansion beyond people to people communication or people to computer um, interactions. Um, lastly, um, CB Insights mentioned, you know, exciting year in 2013, there was one billion investments in venture cap investments into IoT companies. Um, that sounded really exciting, uh, but then something happened in 2014 that people got way more excited about um, that really got people talking about IoT and, and uh, also user experience in IoT. Uh, anybody have any ideas on what that might have been? Boom! So you don't need to hint, um, and I think it was probably already top of mind. <laughs> um, so uh, the Nest acquisition. So Google buying Nest Labs for $3.2 billion. Um, pretty crazy. Can I turn this one off? Oh, actually leave that one on. Leave that one on, turn this one off. I'll turn this one off. I don't like feedback. There we go. That kind of feedback. Feedback is okay for you guys, not from the sound system. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, cool. Uh, so yeah, obviously the Nest acquisition, um, 3.2 billion, that's pretty massive. Um, all for a thermostat, people were like, what the heck? Um, but if you look pretty closely at the product and the product experience that Nest created, um, it's quite a departure from the programmable thermostats that we had, from the interface, um, the industrial design, the feel of it. Um, if any of you have had one of those and got one of those, I think you um, have much more positive emotions about this thing um, than you do about that thing. So I think it would make sense to break down the Nest product experience and to, to better understand why it was worth so much uh, and really why it's unique as compared to just another thermostat. Um, so first off, you know, we're gonna look at six different areas um, of, the, of the experience and that experience that needs to be designed. So first off, the vision and messaging. So um, Nest Learning Thermostat learns your schedules, programs itself, and can be controlled from your phone. Nest Thermostat can lower your heating and, costs, heating and cooling bills up to 20%. Sounds pretty exciting. Distribution and packaging. Um, so they're selling online, obviously. Some people like to shop online, but they're also selling in hardware stores alongside other thermostats. And in many cases, like as soon as you walk in the door, like Home Depot, like they're like right there. Um, and so very accessible, very easy to access. Um, as far as packaging goes, comes in a pretty little box um, and comes with all the equipment you need to get it set up. Comes with screws, actually comes with a little screwdriver to help with the installation, a trim kit to cover over that old ugly hole from your last thermostat, um, and wiring labels to help you make that, that, that experience a little bit easier. Then you look at the next experience that the customer would have, um, and that's the physical installation of the device. Um, and so we've got the included tools that were in the package, plus there's an online tool that they built for like personal instructions on how to configure the Nest in your house. So you can say what kind of furnace you have, what kind of wires you saw when you un uncovered it, and then it gives you a customized and personalized set of instructions of how to do this, so, which is pretty helpful, um, especially when you look at how challenging it can be with some of those older thermostats. Um, I installed one two years ago and it was pretty, pretty confusing. Um, especially when all the wires were the same color when it came out, so I had to make my own little labels to like decide which things were. So, um, and then also an optional like pro setup track, so they kind of hide most of the complex stuff, assuming that you know the 90% is um, going to have this easy um, installation of the product. The next thing, once you get the unit installed, is the device configuration, um, and this is a pretty critical step because this is what's going to make it make the product actually work. So. Thinking about the device configuration experience is, is a pretty important one. Um, I remember when the device was first coming out, I was like, how are you going to connect this thing to a Wi-Fi network? Like, how are you going to enter a password? Um, they came up with a clever little solution where they put a keyboard around the outside of the device. And obviously, I mean, you wouldn't, write, you wouldn't use a device to text message or write emails. But for entering the Wi-Fi password, it works. It's kind of clever. Um, so they solved for that. And then a bunch of other setup stuff. You can create a Nest account so you can get weekly reports on energy savings and usage. Um, and then there's also the opportunity to connect to other services, right? So um, you can connect your Nest account to other services and start doing really interesting things um, uh, around home automation. Um, then the next experience to think about is the regular usage. So the thing that I think most people like about Nest is like there's very little setup. Um, you can kind of just install it, it'll start working and start trying to figure out your schedule. You can tweak it, 
Um, but there are the options to monitor um, and manage uh, the device uh, either online or with the mobile apps. And it's really funny because I've heard more people talking about the temperature of their home who have nests than certainly than those who don't. Um, so it kind of indicates that they've created this really good experience about like keeping track of what's going on at your house and the temperature of your house and how you can save energy. Um, much, much different and quite, a, quite an advancement from traditional, uh, traditional thermostats. And then the last, last item to, or experience to think about is how do you do support and maintenance for these devices. So you create this device, you send it in the wild, people uh, install it, configure it, start using it. At some point, there's going to be the need for support and maintenance. Nest does this really nicely. If you're connected to your Wi-Fi network, they, you can push software updates to the device, which is, uh, which is really slick. So, you know, you'd think that it's like, okay, that sounds well and great. Um, Pretty easy to do, I think. Uh, turns out it is pretty challenging to do. Um, a lot of companies are, are either good at hardware or they're good at software. Um, the combination of the two, uh, which is definitely seen in the result of a product like the Nest, uh, is pretty unique, pretty hard to find. Um, and that's because it is, it is a little bit hard. The two of them are kind of counterintuitive, um, for starting with process and skills. So obviously a different skill set between, you know, embedded development versus you know making an iPhone app, for example. Um, the hardware development process has a little bit longer and often more costly uh, iteration cycles. So we always work in agile development, so you know we're looking at doing a, a MVP, then doing building on it, learning and like growing it out. The hardware cycles are always a little bit longer and usually are a little more costly um, than software cycles. Uh, example I like to give is you know, developers working on um, a mobile application or a web application, for example, they come into some problem, they're like, oh, I need a new like component or new library to use. Well, it's pretty easy to just go, pull it into the project, import it, set it up and run. Um, if you're building hardware and you're like, oh shoot, we don't have this component, um, it could be like a week uh, before you get it. So uh, quite a difference in, in the two of those things. Um, distribution and deployment are very different between hardware and software. Software nowadays, um, one huge channel is obviously web. Um, web deployment, uh, so over web servers, uh, and then the other would be through you know, the app stores that we all know for mobile. Um, so again, shipping hardware, packaging, packaging logistics, or if you have um, distribution partners doing, doing uh, distribution to those vendors and getting in-store placement and stuff, it's a whole different ballgame um, than software. And lastly, revenue models. Um, hardware, if you're a hardware native business, you're probably going to be kind of experts at managing the cost of your components and uh, comparing that with product, product, product revenues uh, and making sure that's, that's balanced and in check. If you're a software company, uh, you're probably looking at more service business models. Um, often with recurring revenue streams. So again, pretty different um, between the two, and so it's, it's pretty challenging for companies who want to get into the other business to, to kind of realign themselves and make sure there's a balance between those two things. So really the, the key on this slide is integrating the physical and digital development. Um, pretty, pretty challenging, but definitely possible. Main thing is getting those teams like super close together and talking to each other um, and, uh, and working really well together. So, Next, just want to cover, it's related to the, the Nest example that we went through, um, is kind of these six IoT product experiences. So assuming that you're making some kind of physical product that you want to ship out, um, there's six areas that I usually talk about uh, that you want to consider the whole experience for. So each of them requires a deep dive and like thought on each, each step of the way. Um, but at a high level, these are, these are the six to look at. So first up, um, visioning, visioning and messaging. So, it's important to make sure, uh, number one, that the vision, before you even try and message it to consumers, um, you're actually fulfilling a consumer need. Um, you're not just building something for the sake of building it and, and making it smart and connected. Um, the classic example is the company that made it the connected fridge um, that had like a browser on it, on like a tablet on the fridge, and everyone was just like, I don't want that. Like I have a phone, I have a laptop, why would I want to go to my computer? my fridge and browse, maybe to get a recipe, but I don't think it's worth the you know, 3x cost for that fridge versus just getting another fridge and having a tablet or, or whatever. So making sure, number one, the vision, you're actually um, fulfilling a, a real consumer need. 
um, and then you're providing some utility to that end user, and the messaging should obviously convey that, as we saw with the Nest example. Packaging and distribution, obviously you want to make it as easy as possible for people to get this product, acquire this product, um, and make it enjoyable. Uh, obviously the classic example of, of that right there would be Apple um, with their retail stores as well as their partner distribution channels. They always have crazy experiences. Even if you go to Future Shop, they have a little desk that looks like a miniature Apple store. Um, and then the products themselves obviously come in beautiful packaging that it's exciting to unravel and, and open this product. Physical installation. Um, important to think about who's going to be installing this device. So you might be building some device that's like for service technicians to go install. That's like one type of user. Uh, in the Nest example, it's mom or dad going, or maybe <laughs> father or, or daughter or son going, who's excited about this thermostat that's going to install it. Very different um, people, so make sure you think about that. Uh, device configuration, reinforcing privacy and security. Everyone's pretty concerned when they talk about connecting more stuff to their Wi-Fi network at home that's going to start broadcasting data and all this kind of stuff. So make sure you think around that. And from a product design, obviously, it better actually do it, um, but also reinforcing it with messaging. Um, and then thinking about how to configure integration with other products and services. So one would be, simple example is connecting to a Wi-Fi network at home. How's that actually going to happen? Um, and then other services, if you want to integrate with other third parties that might be able to activate or deactivate your device or read data from your device, et cetera. Next is regular usage. So thinking about under what conditions this device is going to be used, thinking about how to store and track um, and make sense of all the data that will be generated by this device, whether that's just providing it to the consumer or you're doing something at a, a, a wider scale and looking at a bunch of sensors and coming up with pattern recognition and that kind of stuff. Um, and the last one, um, how to not annoy with predictive analytics. So. Uh, I always get, I remember when uh, Apple announced beacons and stuff and I was talking with some uh, a few friends that are marketers and they're just like, oh, that's awesome. So as soon as they walk in the store, we can just start slamming them with like messages. And I was like, sure you can, but they're probably not going to like that. Um, so that's, that's context-based and predictive analytics. Um, the classic example there is the uh, father in the States that got a personalized flyer um, that predicted that. Um, he was like, why am I getting all this stuff with baby, you know, recommendations of baby products? And it turns out it's because his 16-year-old daughter was pregnant. Um, so how do we not annoy, not be too intrusive with predictive analytics um, and make it a, make it a good, good positive experience, not a creepy um, or uncalled for experience? And the last, support and maintenance. Um, need to think about what maintenance is going to be required to actually keep this device running, whether it's daily, monthly, annually, et cetera. Um, very basic example of that would be like how much battery, if it's a battery operated device, how much battery um, time do you actually get with the device? I think we all have uh, a pretty decent ball and chain that we're always thinking about how much more do I have? How much more do I have? Do I need to plug? I need to plug. Um, so how many more devices those can we have in our life? Not sure. Uh, this is enough for me and uh, wearables and, and whatnot. Um, so thinking about that, thinking about what that burden is going to be and you can balance that off with the design of the application. Uh, and then how do we monitor and update this thing? So how do we make sure that it's still working? Um, what if it drops offline? How do you recover from that? Um, and then how do you provide software updates to it? So that's about it. Thanks very much. Thank you. finished a little bit early. Um, we're going to be taking a break, I guess, until the sessions resume at 1 o'clock. And uh, I guess we'll see you after lunch. Are we doing any questions? Yeah, oh, sorry. Why don't we get to, yeah, let's go up here and say, uh, let's see if you have any questions. Uh, My apologies. <laughs> it's thrilling to hear what everybody has shared. This is a question for Damien. Uh, Mark and Jason is famous for saying software reads the world. I kind of get the experience that uh, uh, experience evangelists uh, kind of believe that experience is eating the world alternatively. And then that's a good thing. But I, I, um, I'm, I'm curious, it's almost as if uh, uh, business process, business rules, data model, everything becomes rolled under the umbrella of uh, experience. And uh, I'm thinking of, for instance, the, the thermostat. 
one of the things that is doing its work behind the scenes. I'm experiencing the warmth of the house, but it's doing work behind the scenes. As the product designer, I'm, we have to kind of open up that black box of what's inside there and put the, the business semantics or the engineering semantics in the box. And that seems to me to be bigger than experience. So I guess my question is, uh, it, it, is it fair to say that in, you're using experience as an umbrella for everything, or is there, some, is there something else in terms of IoT products that doesn't follow under that umbrella? Yeah, so I, I think you're absolutely right that the magic that happens behind the curtain um, is almost equally as important as um, the magic that happens in front of the curtain, how beautiful the curtain is, how nice it is to touch it and, and interact with it. Um, and so, yeah, I, I definitely didn't cover off the like development or technical side of things, but I would totally agree that, that that's a very, very important side of um, figuring out the solution. But at the end of the day, all of that should really be driven from what it's like for the user to use the product um, and, your, and, and interact with it, because that's where you're going to have success. That's what's going to get people talking about the temperature in their house to their friends and the new thermostat. Um, that's where you're going to get the real success. Obviously, it's almost a given, it just has to, the rest of it has to work, um, but that front end, how beautiful that curtain is, um, really, really nice. All right, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, um, okay, so uh, actually there's a really weird company out there, it's called Sony. They, they have all those new gadgets. Sony? For example, they, Sony, yeah. Okay. For example, they have this uh, attachable camera to your phone, yes. and then you can change the lens on it, and then it has the, the, the DSLR sensor and everything. And the Sony has done so much innovations these years. Basically, they are the only companies that keep doing that. Right? But they, they are just not popular at all. For example, their wearables actually tracks oh, how many days, uh, how many times you read a book, you walk, you eat. It's kind of creepy, but <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, what do you think in a uh, UX perspective? What do you think of Sony? Well, I, I think the Sony is pretty well. Uh, that discussion with a lot of people. Sony is pretty well. Yesterday's uh, Apple, right? Like the idea is at one point in time they ruled the world of bio, yeah, everything they had. They're perfect. You know, they're investing a lot of money in, 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 and they're selling a lot of the products. Actually, sold in terms of Japan, and we adopted that the, the Japanese phrase sort of. So I think right now what you're seeing with Sony is that there, there's other problems there. So I don't want to necessarily say this UX thing and then transfer it back to that other point. I think. They're, they're, they're basically surviving on PlayStation right now and, and the other ones. So they, they are coming up with innovation design. They still do that. You look at their website, they're talking about their kind of design house, right? But I think that's, maybe that's kind of like what we're talking about connected labs. It's a whole gamut. Like they are not executing on the whole situation. So they might have interesting technology in it itself. Is maybe that's the take home message is having interesting technology in it itself is just not enough anymore. There's lots of interesting technology. Right? Like, I don't know if you guys want to have a better way of putting it. Well, the only thing I would touch on Sony is, from my personal experience back when they were in their heyday, proprietary cords. So the types of cords that plug into my devices, I could, if, I, if that cord was shot, I couldn't go grab another standard cord and plug it in. They always had some funny way that you know, you'd have to go buy their special cord. And there's other people doing that right now, too. So. Yeah, works with PlayStation. yeah, like so standardization uh, for simple elements that fail, like a power cord. Um, that's great for a user. That's like okay, I need I need to grab another cord, you know. But you know, when, when a company gets so big that they want to nickel and dime and try and make money off that cord too, that's that's that sucks. Right? It's terrible. Apple does that. Though. Yeah. I mean, Apple does that. Yeah, you have to pay like fifty bucks for it. Yeah. It's ridiculous. So, but the thing is, they're excelling that. I think this would be that Sony because Sony was just like, here's a device, and and whatever you get, the, the quality of the of the experience and, and the values is it. It's baked into the device. The walking was amazing, but that's all it does. And I think Apple's able to say, well, you get the device and now it's a portal to all these services and all this world like we're gonna delight you. We're constantly gonna delight you with this thing every single day. I'm gonna go like, I can't believe my iPhone's doing this thing now, and I can't believe it. And just continuing and continuing, and that relationship and that thing is you know churning. I don't think so. You missed the boat on that. So, uh, question for you guys: In terms of you know the Internet of Things, a lot of the things are commoditizing and cheap and easy to acquire. A lot of the software is open and available and extensible and, and whatever. 
it's very difficult from a business perspective now to kind of to build a defensible product that you can now get investors to kind of how could design help in that regard? Is there is can you patent the design? Can you copyright the design? Can it protect you in any way that or can it give you um, you know a business advantage, a defensible business advantage with regards to investment? Yeah, I can quickly quickly cover up just a couple things. So design definitely is copyrightable. Um, it's not always the easiest thing to get copyrights on. Um, but thinking just in, in the mobile space alone, um, the the uh, swipe or pull to refresh. refresh. Um, I think it was Twitter that like the ISM was yes, it did, but he has it on the sort of open uh, license that people kind of use. So yeah. he's using that as an anti pattern to, to allow people to come back and he says, you know, I'm only patenting it to protect other people from trying to patent it later on and block it from other people. Yeah. Um, but those are the Twitter guys. That, that one's an interesting question because I think what happens is a couple of patents too, but the, the market now is, is quite different. So back in the day, you kind of hit in the corner and you, you use something as a call trade secret or trade, trademark, or you can patent something and you, you take a process applied. And, and patent, I don't know if people understand it, it's a crapshoot in a little way. Like, live stream, okay, don't say anything that. So <laughs> at the end of the day, is, the idea of that is we're, we're trying to go as a mass, right? So you put your patent in, you make an application of patent, the patent office is going to declare your application regardless of whether you get granted the patent or not. And it will go into public. And you get in your 50 years and use it and you try to monopolize it. Uh, just recent, a couple of years ago, back then, I was able to get a process patent for barcoding for workforce automation. You know, the people with security guards who move around another company that was CTO of the company for. But now we're doing less and less process patent applications. And so th there's a sort of game that you try to keep a secret and then you have to throw it out there and hopefully the patent office grants it. Because if not, then that patent display is going to put in. I remember drawing all these big documents and getting a lawyer smack me on the back of the head and said, like make it uglier, and I had a lawyer redraw my 3D AutoCAD drawings to this thing on this piece of paper to make it could be anything, right? So I think the app, the moral of the story there in that one is like I think John talked about this experience. I would say the Nest non-interacting is still an experience. That's the hidden experience. That's the awesome. I don't want it to annoy me, right? And that, that the same thing with the path fake. I was saying if you build something that's enlightening, delighting, that's going to be ultimately the technology we're seeing. The patent protection for the technology, it just moves so fast that what we do is right now we patent on almost a defensive basis. So to protect somebody to come back to us, it's not an innovation basis because at the end of the day we've had stuff like I work with the same technology within SQL Anywhere and stuff like that. And we find we find somebody has a patent that we like the code slightly different and around the patent. It's not a blocking aspect. And I don't think if you rely on a patent, there's only companies that out there who are making money at that are the the patent police kind of people, like NTP, who buy patent and try to go after people, and then what happens is the company either pays its way out or makes it work around. But that's not a driver. Like you're not innovating. That that that's not selling something to people. That's chasing after people. That that would be my comment. I don't know if you guys. Uh, well, one thing I would touch on that is if the Internet of Things goes into the service industry really big. Uh, I can see like first to market moves as uh, a very big advantage for you, and that's where an interaction designer can pick up on, like what I talked about the the, the bar that has, you know, systems in place that um, improve your services, where the, the bar across the street doesn't have those yet. Um, so designers think about those things, and if you're a business that's you know always in the forefront of trying to solve your your customers' needs. I think that that competitive advantage of being first to market is really good. Designers are excellent at it. Where's the markets on are always winners? Yeah. No, that's yeah. right. <laughs> yeah. A question. Um, Kevin Ashton, the guy who coined the phrase Internet of Things, he defines it as computers being able to understand the physical world without the need for human entered data. So he's basically saying the Internet of Things is no UI. There should be no user interface. The interesting thing that happens, and I mean, it's good for this, like everyone will bring the Nest example and be like, what a beautiful UI. And yeah. you're like, okay, well, no. <laughs> uh, my, my question then is really from a design perspective. Um, what do you think are the, the challenges? And what do you think will be that first experience that people will get it? That this is an IoT experience because I didn't do or touch anything. How do you see that getting over that hurdle of stop talking about Nest and start talking about an anti experience or whatever we're going to call it? I, mean, I, I guess I'll go first because that was my anti slide, right? <laughs> so uh, I think what happens is that we've been talking about for years like, the idea is that you go into a shop and you pick up something and you be 
Uh, so Apple is sort of doing that. You can kind of pre-buy it and then you can walk out with the device and they won't jump you as you jump in the store. But they, 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 there's a little trickery kind of going, that's the Wizard of Oz behind it, and you're doing a bunch of things beforehand. Uh, we're, we're still not there with the planograms and, and sort of things that we, we work a lot with uh, retailers. Um, I think in the end of the day, it will be a non-experience, much like the Nest. You're not fidgeting with the dial anymore. You're going to eliminate a process that you thought, oh my goodness, like, for example, if you never had to put your password in, your web password for a uh, wireless access point, would you, could you guys live with that? Could you guys live with that? Yeah. Could you guys move on from that? Yeah. So I think what happens is when you start taking off these little pieces, it will make life a little better. You won't know it the day that you stop using it, it's really annoying. You could, but maybe a couple weeks later, and then some kid comes up and says, like, wow, that like, a person made a 3D printed model of what the save icon looks like, and it's a discount, right? Like, we'll be talking about it in that for instance, so I think, I think that's one thing that's gonna be like, it's going to be, you just missed it. You didn't even do that. Yeah. You walked right in, and Apple TV does a little bit like that. So you know, you walk in. You, you, that was the ecosystem we showed you didn't have. You know, I'm going to take my song. I'm going to take it into my house. I'm, I'm working on an article. But projects on TV. I'm like talking to you. Well, your eyes aren't good enough. But I know. Make it like huge, so you can see it. And it's instantaneous. And we have all these video games now that we can use uh, peer to peer sync, right? So I can play darts with you with my flicking my tab and stuff like that, and all those other things. So, so I think what happens is users, you're going to skip over steps that used to do and used to annoy you, and you won't see that. So it won't be a new window that pops up and say, like, oh, that's amazing. It's going to be, don't make the crash screen blue to get rid of this blue screen death. You, you get rid of the whole screen all together. Yeah. yeah, definitely the, the emergence of beyond the screen is not really going to be recognizable. There's just, your life is just going to, die. from what I can see is, it just, it just, it's this invisible intelligence that starts to change your world around you. It's not all about, like you, you mentioned, this UI starts to, just to not be in your face all the time. So um, not everything's gonna be recognizable if, if, if your world becomes entirely intelligent. One example is Mile Vision out of Waterloo, who are working on traffic light cameras. Um, Toyota, Motor, Toyota Motor Manufacturing in Cambridge, uh, when everybody gets out at five o'clock from their shift, a major influx of traffic around our area. That technology has the ability to change the uh, intersection green lights. So if I'm leaving and Toyota has uh, run over their production time and they get out a bit later, the, the, the intersection lights can uh, adopt, adapt to the traffic parameters. So if I'm in a rush that day and I have no idea, but all of a sudden it's, you know, and I get caught behind traffic, well there's a world emerging where those uh, friction points become less. So you won't even know what happened, that some traffic light changed uh, an hour before you that let the flow of traffic move through your city. Uh, you just get home, you didn't see anything happen. There's no screen there, but there's this, this internet happening you know, of some device making you know, friction points less. So I look at the world of the internet things kind of going in that direction as well, where there's like an inanimate objects that happen and it just, you don't see it, in, but it improves your life some way or another. Yeah, for sure. I see it also, um, another example that gets talked about is in transportation. So um, so imagine that you know rather than waiting for, um, you know, you're, you've got a flight, plane comes in from wherever it's coming from, uh, you know, it's grounded, and at that point, they see that something's wrong, and you, they can't fly the aircraft. Um, It'd be amazing if before that aircraft lands, before somebody physically sees something or checks something, um, they already know and they're already getting on the next flight. So I agree, if there is no user interface, that implies that like, you might not see it. Yeah, You'll yeah. probably feel it, but you might not know why. You'll just be happier that like the experience happened better than it might have had that automation not been happening. So. Was that a comment or a question? A question. Yes. How ready do you think we are in terms of design team, design culture, tools and processes to sort of figure out these problems. These are new problems to figure out, and it's a new kind of skill set and stuff, you know, compared to like software and other things before that we had to kind of ramp up to. Where, where are we now, and where do we need to go, and what are the friction points that come from? Who wants to take on first? <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry, can you, can you read one? Can you say that one more time? Yeah, basically we have a lot of new challenges, yeah. design challenges, yeah. and you need design teams and people think and have tools and processes to like tackle these new problems. How ready are we to do that? And if we're not, what are the like, friction points and pain points that we need to improve on? We're the next generation for generations that people. Yeah. 
I think different businesses are at different levels. So smaller teams understand design faster, they're, they're more nimble. Uh, they got their finger on the pulse. Enterprise, wow, I mean, they're, 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 they're way late on identifying what the advantages are to having the user experience. So they're just getting, okay, well, what, what's the advantage of hiring the UX guy? Well, there's lots of advantages, and they're just catching on where, you know, people like, uh, well, Apple been doing it for since they started. That was one of the things that drove their company. So you can't show up 10, 15 years later and go, oh, well, let's get the UX guys in now. Well, that's, you missed that boat. So people, from my perspective, are just getting used to UX, and now you're going to come in and start talking about the Internet of Things. They're, they're both two paradigms that are massive, and uh, I think there's a lot of people that are late on that boat, but the small teams, the startups, are killing it. They, they're, they're, they're having designers on their, their uh teams early which is awesome but as soon as you start to uh, scale up I don't I see them bringing in UX uh, you know UX designers of one who do everything and that's a lot of pressure for a, a designer to go okay well I've got to do it all um, so I think there's that it's, it's late I mean <laughs> yeah that's, that's, that's late. Uh, um, yeah I would say that uh, right now with the exception of some like companies who are mostly in the startup space and obviously large product companies that are doing software and hardware right now. Um, they're all right, but like most people who are thinking about it now are not set up for it. Um, and they probably are separated into like software and hardware if they are doing both. Probably they're not doing both and probably they're only doing one of the two. Um, and so I think there is, uh, there's gotta be a meeting of the two sides that needs to happen and an understanding of the two sides. Uh, and in order to make it to make it happen, um, you know, if, if you're in an organization, you might only have like user interface designers, right? Who don't don't get industrial design, which is totally understandable. Yeah. Um, but it's, you're selecting materials, and like it's a whole different space. Um, and so there's definitely a, a there's a new set of skills required. And today, I think those skills sit in different places. Um, so there will be an exercise to, to bring them together to figure it out. So you've got a lot of questions. What was your name again? Carla. Carla. So Carla. Okay, so I'm going to take that a little bit too because I think I represent a different edge spectrum. Like, I'm a one of 68,000 employees. In That's it. <laughs> so, 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 if only startups bang this out in the end of things, I might have to do my job. But uh, I think the difference, maybe Damon, to touch on a little bit, like guys like Cisco, like they're getting a lot here. I think our, our uh, SAP is involving a lot of information on the internet things. I think besides it, the flexibility in small groups, like that's agile scrum, you know, plus or minus seven, plus or minus two kind of thing, right? Uh, I think also big companies have the ability, what we need to do is they just need to pivot slightly. So if Cisco, if they have all the riders and stuff like that, they just need to pivot a little bit to add open back APIs and stuff like that. SAP, we have all the data, we have all the database, we just need to pivot a little bit to add in hardware for like smaller things. We're not just talking to big companies. So there's a spectrum. So yes, I don't think, um, are we ready right now? I think we're getting ready. Right I think the only problem is it's just really hard to see because it's like a funnel in sales and it takes a while. We've been working, but there's things that we've been working on we can't tell you about right now, right? And, and it'll take a little bit, but I think the skills are what SAP is looking for intentionally. It, besides, the, we have a huge ramp up to try to get general right people. Uh, we always talk about T-shaping. So what we gotta talk about is hiring people that are T-shaped. What we want people with an extreme depth of knowledge in one area, and then they need to be varied because in design thinking, we need multi disciplinary people first to meet the multi so no longer are we hiring people who have, and might be just that expert in something. We are building our company, our driving and our talent are looking for what we call T-shaped people. More and more people that can talk over a different world. Sure, they might have a single web. I joke about say sometimes with M-shaped people, you know, they might have a different topic. But the idea is that you're talking about the next generation. We have no new sciences. The sciences that we bring are collections of existing things, like biomedical and stuff like that. So what happened? That means we need people that are not just experts in one vertical. And that's the next generation. We're trying to hire those people, and we have some of those people in there. So I think we're getting ready for that, Carla. I don't want some pizza. I think we can do hands. Yeah, I guess we'll have time for one more question. And uh, We can just talk offline afterwards if you guys want to. But want I don't to know how you guys want One more question? I have time. I have time. So much <laughs> together. Yeah. <laughs> uh, who, who wants to go? One more question. Um, I was wondering if you take your Okay, go, go. Uh, I was wondering because you, you guys all gave examples of like, different uh, 
products that are using this. Like, and I was wondering, um, like, because it all comes down to like, the hardware. Like, you're talking about how it's not stable, so it allows you to more flexibility in your copy and the interface and stuff like that, right? But, um, like, for example, the projectors, right? Um, you can update it, but at a certain point, you're still going to have to, you're going to kind of have to connect to new speaker system or a new projector or something, whereas maybe you move the Thing. That's a lot more flexible because it's just the temperature and then the main thing is like how you're adjusting it and stuff like that. And I was wondering, um, like, just if you can talk about like how you see the difference between different devices, like how, how flexible it is, like compared to pure software or something that's more closer to the hardware. Okay, so I think I started getting your question. So, 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 so before the old projector was down here, I would say that, that control bit, like the direct control, right? And I'd say as we go up, yeah, you're saying that some of them we can upload new firmware and stuff. So this projector, if it was connected to, as I say, Panasonic or something like that, it could go up and get Panasonic's firmware. I'm saying the next generation is cooperation and kind of like that cooperation bit. And what happens is that means that projector goes out and says, hey, Ford Storehouse, I'm at like 80,000 lumens, I'm almost dead. Like, Go pre-order that one to a local store, alert somebody that they may have to purchase that one or if it's on a support contract. That's that cooperation. Or this projector goes against the lights and says, hey, I'm trying to project here, okay? Can you guys dim yourselves down or something like that? That's what we're talking about, that cooperation. So it's not just about updating that software. We're there. I think we're there. I think it's the cooperation. And when the projectors and everything work together, plus the big theater, like what happens if you're showing a movie and some guys talking in the corner? Like, Everybody's got to be on the same page, and that's the power of cooperation, right? So that's why I think that the new generation is, is going to have that interactivity, and it's just for your story. Like, M2M's been around for a long time. Like, I've been at technologies like RFID, I've been five years away, I've been five years away. <laughs> like, that's the saying that we use all the time, right? And this is not nothing new, but the thing is that we're, these things have gotten to the point of almost intelligence that we connect them together, that they can kind of speak to each other. And then that's where I think the projector, you. You might, you might not pay for it to, like the object, you might not pay for a projector that depreciates anymore, you might rent a projector. Like all these engines, you know, in these new planes, they aren't bought. They're basically licensed or rented from Boeing, and you get the latest and greatest all the time. They're tracking the analytics, predicting the patterns, all that stuff, right? And then it becomes like, as we were earlier talking about, I think a guy from Arrow, like yesterday, was talking about the service and stuff like that. So that part of it will change too. Maybe the mentality is that like you're renting a projection service and they take care of everything. So two, like your question has to be not just the hardware, it's maybe you're purchasing a service, right? So that's kind of a long answer. But just, you know. That's all the time we have left. Thank you, everyone.
because they have to take care of you know all the all the things. Do you, do you think that this is a challenge that will have a much more the size of the power and all that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, some of these guys will come out and actually try to make it easier to play off of your head. I agree. I'm not supposed to moderate the game. Like, so, like, yeah, let's talk for 20 minutes. Kind of, that's what I was like, yeah, the question I had about what it requires is that you're going to do some work on the whole right here. So, let's, yeah, I don't think anybody's going to be like, okay, how do I get it? So I think by the part, I think I'm going to ask about this. I don't know if you're a sort of my mind. I'm going to get a lot of that stuff from the middle of the year. That's a logical, and then we're going to try to find like, you know, when we have some rest, I don't know about you, but, you know, we're talking about unity, so you're going to use like two guys. It's also the same level, same level. Who cares about it? I don't know how easy it is. It is, it is, it is. I do a lot of one when I run myself. This is not so the first one. I think it's a good one. It's a good one. It's a good one. I will actually understand the way go to the next stage as well. I'll send a text to a new one. It's only a different call. That's how it works. That's how it works. But it was so serious. And then the thing is, I got locked down. But it's just a lot of people. It's too very different. So we all went higher. We got the actual standard. It's not a lot of people. 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 And you get that started there, and then this is And so what they did is they did actually with hashtag pages, they did really do a text message and switch. Everyone's just going to eat this. And so, or no. I didn't know how to say it. I didn't even 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 know how to say it. And so by the time you open your phone, it's like there's a push from Google saying, hey, like, authorize this lot, you just hit authorize, and you'll see that you don't need here, so the speaker just goes whatever. So it's like, it's a much more coordinator implementation versus like, okay, here's the code, and I got two or eight, four or five, like the speaker. That's cumbersome and that's annoying. But when you can like, take advantage of that, I mean, how do you set up your If you have more rich applications, you can go over the machine. Action here, and it goes to the files that you can tell them to break down. And I think things like that increase the security. I never do that. My first answer is my second answer. My second answer is that. Yeah, I mean, for example, I just take you as a good idea. I don't know if this is worse than worse. These days, they send you this device with actual numerals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You heard of that. And then you go to the bank, you want to change something, they give you a digit code, and then you are supposed to enter. Some buttons, some yeah. sequence, yeah. and then you enter the key, 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 and then you generate a code that only lasts for half a minute. Yeah. We need to quickly you know, put it in. And yeah, yeah. I, you know they they are making it more and more complicated. Yeah, that's yeah. not the right. <laughs> but um, <laughs> security wise, well, the key company, you know, they 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 have to like keep upgrading it, keep upgrading it. Where's the what? Disappointment. There is no idea. It's not just the storage. That's what it is. So, okay. There's a lot of rules. So, we got to bring it to the it, it takes the most complicated power of the state. And those people, and their egos, they go, okay, so you're in the first place. Right, right. That's 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 Yeah, that's just like, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's much yeah. worse than yeah. like that. Who cares? I mean, it's not just here. Like, your application is not so good. It's not secure. That's much more. Much of a lot of the users. It's like that. Yeah. It's like that. 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 I'm in software engineering. That's part of the standard procedure. I'm trying to get They're trying to get Sort of. 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 Sort of.
year and a half contract with Flash Software Innovation. Cool. So, and they're like totally in the area of Flash Software. That's why I'm using my question. I, I, so I tweeted. Uh, user experience uh, claims to uh, be in the world. <laughs> no, but it's positive though. Yeah, yeah. It's like uh, one of my friends is Rami Tom. It's like user experience. It's like something about there. You know what I mean? Because we are designing things that are so very important. And then my question was going to be, how do business analysts and user experience, how do the two domains work together? Because in really business analysts is the designer, it is the User, a business experience yeah, designer kind of person. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. 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 It's like the IT where I run code, you know, you know I run the uh, mainframe, and you're a business analyst, but you know that's not just because you weren't so good in calculus, it's yeah. 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 that's not very nice, yeah. but it's an issue. Yeah. So, but I'm thinking, no, we don't think that business analysts are all, you know, I suppose if you go to the business analysts, you have to have more experience, more stuff. Yeah, the thing, so the thing is like, you know, it's like, I get a lot of people, but then I was like, they all like didn't like each other. And then they all so what they did is they they all doubted each other. And then they all started trying to do each other's work. And then that made them even more mad or something. I think that would be good. It's like frustrating. Well, no, because it didn't have to be a good thing. So, many A's. BAs are starting to like, like, to use it. It's a really big company. We have enough to have different tribes. It looks like many of the viewers, you know, the the bakers of princes go meet on some religion. Go through the options on Twitter. Pretend they stop on the air. Yeah, so I started asking them, like, you know, dude, it's like, you each, you each have, like, the BA is like, I'm not a business inside you. Like, they all have like, business rules. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. Like, you guys have to work together, right? Yeah. 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 So, so every yeah. Yeah. I mean, from yeah. every pattern, yeah. like, oh, so right. so so IBM, we didn't know where, I didn't know where, we didn't have enough job. Because we're an enemy, kind of like, my team, we didn't do a good job of that, like, at the time in the middle, are you really yeah. frustrated? Like, yeah. Yeah. our biggest thing is, like, yeah. think, but like okay. part, part of our mission is, like, to be in the air, like, get into the world, and my team, like, you're in the air, and 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 did I get a question? I think it's in Okay, fine. Yeah, come on. Well, I, I get my bag. Get my well, here, uh, send me an email. I should get a bag. Yeah, yeah. Your bag is up there. Yesterday I came in. Let me just run and grab it. No, no, no. Although I didn't get a bag. Did it mean like So I was going to do it. So the weather, like, sort of fishing around in the other industries that you can change your time to stay in there, like, the first thing I just want to talk about 30 years is not to have the ability to use the Okay. Yeah, I was doing some checks, and they were always in the room trying to find new ones. Right, right, right. Now I can also be famous. Okay. Do you know where the shoe factory used to be? Right, right. Used to be a shoe factory. See that? Didn't get to the college in Germany. Okay. Okay. Hundreds of times, but I don't remember the shoe factory. So, a friend of mine, yeah, yeah, right. So, where the shoe factory is in Bakersfield. So it's called Bakersfield. Yeah, that's where that's where connected is based. So like, MakeWorks is like a co-working space for so like hardware and software. Um, and then, no, I don't. I actually, I'm not thinking about it. Yeah, I'm sorry. 
I've like seen it's it's hipster. Yeah, yeah, it's it's hipster. Yeah, it's 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 hipster. Hipster. Yeah, it's 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 hipster.
I think about the design yeah. of the of the design yeah. 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 Or the best at that interest are people really like interesting. Like but in the meanwhile, I, uh, I was like, well, so I do have a lot of experience in traditional and then we can do some other things. Traditional to just So tell me a little bit more about some of the past stuff you've done. What feature did you think that you would sell that $10 million that you've worked on? We're finding that the people who are the stuff that we're working on. They were, well, the company were the yeah, they, they were the same. There are not two or three levels deep from, like, from like product owners or sales. Also, radio modules, wireless communication radio modules. Oh, okay. And using wireless communication radio modules, we integrated with companies who already make the most data. Oh, you're making modules. Okay, actually, Jonathan, you know Jonathan? Yeah, yeah, I do. Okay, so yeah, so I used to brother Daniel started. Yeah, okay, the dots are good because Jonathan showed me a Zigbee. Module. That's like, yeah, that's like, 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 so you're so, with so, a, you're like I didn't know. I think, yeah. oh. There's either the, ah, the, the okay. transformation. Right. The dots right. are connected. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Neat. Yeah. Neat. Yeah. That's neat. Um, well, so that company, what's what's up with that company now? I think MB. That's MB. MB networks. Yeah. Is it still going? Yeah. Yeah. It's still going. They are. Finding more focus, I find. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and before it was doing everything, everything, trying to do platforms, and trying to do embed yeah. stuff, and yeah. Yeah. now they're uh, coming back to the more the core, yeah. Yeah. It's just like an embedded wire, wireless communication. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, except, yeah, I got more, so I said that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Interesting. <laughs> Too boring. Um, um, I still have a share. Never been, never been so far. Nice. So right now you're just kind of like freelancing. Yeah, just coming in. Okay. So what I'm trying to just imagine, just so the company can tell what it works. So like, it's you do like do you do hardware design or just like firmware development? What's your what's your yeah? If you were to be like, this is yeah, this is what I can do for you. What is it? Yeah, I just like that. Yeah, my uh, my specialty has been one for a while. So, for a while, I can control it for you. And I think they're missing the last one. Which is like a fragility, which is like you should understand. But as a teacher, yeah, I just think all the mobile stuff as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think it has to be together. Yeah, you know, but that's not your that's not your core. Yeah, yeah. Just to be like really expensive and then just all the stuff. But what language is that? T part C has been mostly sort of really really good at that. Okay, cool. Um, do you have a card? No, I don't have a card. So the also the video you know. Yeah, yeah. I'm grabbing my card. My bag. Come on up. Those are sometimes it's like a card. It's like a card. Every business person would gotta understand. Um, so